For our scripture reading today, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Jude, verse 17. Uh, you'll notice that it's written without a chapter designation because Jude has no chapters. It, it's just, well, it has one chapter, uh, but it's just considered Jude, and, and they give a verse count. We're going to look at Jude, uh, Jude 17 to 25. And, and uh, uh, you're going to recognize uh, some of the language there, I hope. Um, this is the passage from which we get uh, the song that we close our service with, the Jude doxology, and the, uh, the correlation between what's written here and what we sing, uh, it's a little bit rearranged maybe, the language is a little bit different, it, there's a little repetition, uh, but this is the song. A uh, reminder, the word doxology uh, means uh, like a word of glory, uh, and so uh, <clears throat> we want to uh, read that this morning as we think about the uh, the, the praise and honor that belongs to God. Jude 17 uh, through 25. Actually, 17 to 23 is not the Jude doxology. It's kind of the, the prelude to that. Uh, but we will close this with the, the last three verses or whatever. So, <clears throat> so Jude writing to the church says this. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save the others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. And here it comes. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore, Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. It's been a few months now, but uh, we had uh, the church year began uh, with Advent and, and Christmas and the Christmas season. Uh, and, and one of the main themes of that was the idea of uh, Jesus being born in a stable and uh, laying the baby in a manger. Uh, and that idea of the, uh, the humbleness of that. Um, if, if you think in terms of uh, majesty and glory and, and authority and power, uh, it seems like you can't get much farther from that than being born and being put in a, in a feed trough uh, or a manger. Uh, and so that's kind of how Jesus began. Uh, and then uh, just two weeks ago, we observed Palm Sunday here, and uh, one of the themes on that day was uh, instead of Jesus coming in on a white stallion or something or a big black war horse, uh, he came into town riding on a donkey, uh, a young donkey. And, and so that picture, again, is not representative of what we think of when we think of power and glory and majesty and honor and all of that. Uh, it seems like coming in on a donkey um, you know, almost, almost comical, uh, you know, when we see uh, uh, it kind of portrayed in movies where the, the guy gets on a beast that's too small for him and, and tries to ride it and they look kind of awkward and gangly when they do that. And so you get that very, it just doesn't seem like that uh, glory and honor uh, concept. But that's kind of where the story begins and it moves right up through in uh, the crucifixion. Uh, being uh, tried and beaten and, and made fun of uh, and taunted and then crucified, uh, that's pretty humbling too. Uh, it's not very representative of power and glory and authority and honor and, and all of that. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of how it all started with Jesus' ministry. Uh, but I want to begin this message uh, looking at kind of a, a hinge point in the message. 
Um, so we're going to start by looking at a passage from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 12, uh, beginning with verse 20. I'm going to read through 28. John chapter 12, verse 20. Using one of our worship Bibles, you'll find it on page 873. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. I'm actually going to stop there. No, I'm going to keep going. Uh, <clears throat> anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Uh, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is the word of the Lord. That whole concept of the seed dying and being put into the ground, Jesus knew what was coming. He knew there was going to be an arrest and crucifixion, uh, the trial, the beatings. Uh, he, he expected that, and he knew. And, uh, and he's been working for three years in his public ministry, and, uh, and he realizes, and scholars are divided on, uh, on what this, how this came about. Uh, the Greeks came, we want to see Jesus. Jesus, there are some Greeks, so they want to see you. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Like, how is how, that connected? Uh, some say that, that Jesus took the, uh, the idea of these foreigners uh, coming to him as the signal that it's time. My, his reputation was spreading. He was getting to be known. Uh, he had not only come for Israel, but for non, you know, for the Gentiles too. And so this was maybe the signal that let him know that now is the time. The time has come. But uh, the, the time has come. Uh, for arrest, beating, trial, crucifixion. And when Jesus talked about it in this passage, he talked about it in terms of glorification. Uh, that's how he saw this. This was going to be his time of glory. And so he also perhaps looked beyond uh, the arrest, the beating, the trial, the crucifixion to glorification. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, I said I wanted to start there. I want to move on from there. I want us to go to kind of a snapshot of Jesus post-resurrection, post-ascension. Uh, and so, and, and again, it's just a snapshot, uh, but I want to go there because it's also post-glorification. Uh, we've been looking at humble Jesus. We've been looking at manger Jesus. We've been looking at riding a donkey Jesus. Uh, but now, with the resurrection that we celebrated last week, everything has changed. Uh, it, it's, a transformation has taken place. Uh, humble Jesus is now glorified Jesus. He's all power, all authority, almighty Jesus. Uh, and so I want to just take a, a glimpse of that as written uh, in the book of Revelation. And again, just to kind of an intro, we're going to start right with the first verse. Uh, Revelation 1, and I'm going to begin by reading the first uh, three and a half verses. Uh, but we're going to move on from there, so you can leave your Bibles open if you want. Revelation 1, verses 1 to 4a. Uh, the prologue. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything we saw, or everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, 
and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Um, so I want to stop there uh, and, and just kind of point out that uh, most scholars believe that these, uh, those first three verses were added later. That when John wrote this, he started writing with verse 4. And that those first three verses are actually uh, in the style of a title. Uh, in one of those long titles. Uh, we don't title things like that anymore. Uh, but there was a time in history. Uh, there were even, I've, I've read books written by some of the you know, biblical, but from years and years and years ago. Uh, and they would have chapter titles that were almost a paragraph long. Uh, and so that, that was just kind of a, a, a style that has passed on. And so that's kind of the, the title of the book, or it's kind of the explanation of what's coming. And the, and the meat of it begins uh, with, with verse 4. Uh, but uh, for one thing, this prologue gives the book its name. Uh, the first word of the book, if you pick up the Greek manuscript, is uh, the word... Uh, the Greek word apocalyptic, apop, apocalypsis, uh, which translate, was transliterated in English as apocalyptic. And so we talk about it being apocalyptic literature. Uh, apocalyptic translates into the revelation. Uh, and this book begins, the revelation from Jesus Christ, and moves on. And so that's where the book gets its name. It's the revelation. Um, a lot of people talk about, you know, they'll call it Revelations. There's no, it's not plural. It's, this book is collectively the Revelation. It is the revealing of Jesus of some things. Um, <clears throat> but I want to remind you, as long as we're here, uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, biblical uh, side knowledge. Uh, those of you who were at our uh, biblical, introduction to biblical, what did we call it? Introduction to biblical studies? Bible Basics. Bible Basics. Uh, if you were in that class approximately one year ago, um, one of the things that we talked about briefly was, uh, was apocalyptic literature. Uh, but I want to read just a paragraph or so um, that kind of reminds us of, of what apocalyptic is in terms of literature. Uh, <clears throat> uh, says this, uh, apocalyptic writings are marked by distinctive literary features. So that is, it's quite different from other kinds of literature in our Bibles. Particularly, prediction of future events and accounts of visionary experiences or journeys to heaven, often involving vivid symbolism. Later, apocalypse, uh, later apocalypses often built upon and elaborate the symbolism employed by earlier ones. This is particularly the case in the book of Revelation, in which not only earlier apocalypses, but the whole Old Testament is plundered for ideas and symbols. Uh, and so we don't read uh, every book of the Bible the same way. Uh, you know, when you read poetry, you read it one way. When you read uh, historical narrative, you read it a different way. You interpret it a different way. And apocalyptic literature is a third category, or it's its own category. Um, and so there's a lot of symbolism, and, and those of you who are familiar with the rest of the book, you know that, of course. Uh, and, and some of it can be quite confusing. Um, but uh, uh, parts of this, uh, even, even in what we're going to look at in just a few minutes, uh, is kind of, kind of borrowed, and they talked about it um, uh, appropriating earlier apocalyptic literature writings. Uh, and elaborating on them. Uh, some of this, uh, you'll find the, the material originated in like the book of Daniel or in Zechariah. Uh, and so even here, it's, it, that is true. Um, and so uh, the part we're going to look at doesn't have a massive amount of this symbolism and visionary stuff, uh, but it does touch on it. And so I thought it's just, as long as we're here, uh, let's remind ourselves about the meaning of apocalyptic literature. Uh, so let's move on from there. Uh, that last part that I read, Revelation 4a, where it says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, uh, that tells us that this book, besides being apocalyptic literature, was also an epistle or, or a letter. 
And by the way, when we talk about, you know, the epistles, uh, and we sometimes just call them letters, I want to just touch on the difference between an epistle and a letter. Uh, <clears throat> an epistle is more of a, a generalized letter beyond its original audience. Um, so like, for example, in modern days, if you write a letter to the editor of a newspaper, who are you really writing to? It goes to the editor, but your, your purpose is to get it published for every, all the readers to read it. It wasn't just for the person you sent it to. And so these epistles, uh, when Paul wrote to the Romans, it was the intent that this letter I'm sending to Rome is intended for a bigger audience. It applies to, to other Christians, too, and in all ages, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of why they call them epistles and not letters, uh, even though we normally think of them as being letters. The book of Revelation is one. Uh, this whole thing uh, is uh, John is writing a letter to these seven churches in the province of Asia. Uh, and he follows the classic format. That's one of the reasons we know it's a letter. Back then, um, if I write a letter today, you know, I would, you know, Dear Robin, uh, and at the end of it I would sign my name. Back then they began with who's writing it. I would say Wilson to Robin. So, uh, so they begin with the sender, in this case John, uh, who, by the way, in case you didn't know or click, uh, conservative scholars uh, pretty much all agree that uh, John the Revelator, John who wrote the book of Revelation, is John as in Peter, James, and John. Uh, he is John the, of the Twelve Apostles. Uh, he is uh, John who wrote the Gospel of John. Uh, it's, it's, so it's that John um, uh, who's often nicknamed uh, the Beloved Disciple. Uh, or in, in some places, I think last week we might have read, and I didn't elaborate on it or anything, but uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, Jesus loved all the disciples, of course, but there was something special going on, uh, and, and John got that title kind of a thing. So that's kind of who's writing this. Uh, <clears throat> he has been... Uh, kind of banished off to this island where he's by himself. Uh, and then in the recipient, uh, he wrote it to the seven churches in the province of Asia. And of course the question came up, um, why the seven churches? There were more churches in the province of Asia uh, than the seven. Uh, <clears throat> we know, we know uh, of, of some, a couple of them, uh, even referenced in some of the letters that we do have. Uh, Heropolis would be one. Uh, <clears throat> so why the seven, uh, and why the order? Like in the next chapters two and three, there's actually a section for each church. Uh, so most scholars believe that um, this is part of that uh, uh, apocalyptic literature symbolism. In apocalyptic literature, the number seven uh, was often used uh, as a symbol of fullness or completeness possibly deriving from the creation in seven days uh, and you know Jesus having the Sabbath you know like we're in that rhythm of seven days uh, and then we repeat seven days uh, and so seven became kind of a symbol of fullness or wholeness uh, and so the seven churches represent all the churches kind of a thing uh, and that might be why uh, in apocalyptic literature seven were chosen uh, but again this is an epistle uh, and it is intended for us too uh, others say that uh, as some of the some of the other gospels as well, um, the seven churches kind of combined between them pretty much contained all of the characteristics and attributes and patterns uh, that needed to be addressed. Uh, so maybe in like the eighth church, uh, there was nothing there that wasn't covered in the other seven churches' message, uh, and so that might be why there was just the seven. But, um, and then. Uh, it typically in the epistle, the next thing to come would be the greetings. In classical Greek letter writing, uh, John to Wilson, greetings. And, uh, and, and Paul kind of began the process. Uh, in Greek, uh, the wordplay is, is very subtle. Uh, you change like one sound of one uh, syllable or, kind of, or one letter. Uh, the word greetings and grace 
are very close words. And, and Paul took that formula where they, all the letters they sent, they all said greetings, mm -hmm. and Paul changed the word to say grace. So it would be like, you know, Paul to the, or to the, church, in Ro Paul to the church in Rome, grace to you. Uh, and so here we have that, grace and peace, instead of greetings. Uh, and so that's, that's that standard uh, epistle to Lori uh, <coughs> format. Uh, but let's move on now, look at kind of the content. Uh, they began by, uh, most scholars again, talk about the Trinitarian formula here. Uh, he begins by giving us uh, some hints at the Trinity. And again, you know, there's not a Bible passage that says, uh, and God is triune. Uh, it is picked up from, from the kind of some of the clues and, and stuff that we see here. And so, uh, so some of the scholars say this. Uh, <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Uh, that is referencing God the Father. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and from the seven spirits before his throne. And so again, you get this idea of apocalyptic literature. The seven spirits is talking about, you know, the spirit. And so you get the, the, the hint of the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ. Uh, and so just in that passage, you kind of get a, a little bit of a glimpse uh, at the Trinitarian formula. Uh, but my focus today, I want us to, uh, to, to focus on Jesus. And because uh, after talking about the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus, he begins elaborating on Jesus. He kind of, uh, you know, starts broad and narrows it in. And so we get here an elaboration of Jesus. And just in this short passage, um, we really get kind of a three-part formula. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Um, <clears throat> uh, the idea there of Jesus being the faithful witness, uh, again, would have been encouraging. Faithful, uh, the idea of being loyal and and uh, being able to be counted upon. Um, you know, I, I, I've seen uh, uh, court TV drama, uh, you know, these, these TV shows that show trials. And, and just in the last week or two, uh, Rob and I are watching a program, and uh, the witness had been tampered with. And so the prosecutor knew that when he called upon the witness, the witness was going to say, you know, it was that man. And it comes time to ask him in court, and the witness says, I don't recall. See, that is not a faithful witness. No. That's not a witness that can be counted on. Uh, and Jesus was the faithful witness. Uh, you know, he wasn't going to change. He wasn't going to be different. And uh, you also need to know, again, based on when this was being written especially, um, the word witness is the same word as the word martyr. Uh, it's where we get that word martyr. Uh, and so the Christians in that time and place, uh, they were being asked to be a faithful witness under threat of, of execution and torture and death. Uh, <clears throat> it was not an easy time. They, they were sometimes being brought before the authorities and told, uh, you know, deny Christ or die. Uh, and, and so they were being called upon to be faithful witnesses. We're going to be a witness. Um, even under pressure, even under heavy pressure. Uh, you know, I mean, we live in a world uh, where you can be a witness uh, and it might cause you to be teased or taunted. It might cause you to be left out of some things. Uh, it might cause you to lose a promotion. But I would, I would be willing <laughs> to go out on a limb and say that none of us are going to be uh, asked to, uh, are going to be threatened with death for. You know, we're not going to be executed because we wouldn't be like Christ. Uh, that was their very real life. And so calling Jesus the faithful witness, uh, and you know, that would remind them that you know, he, he stood through the cross. And so the, that would give them strength to be faithful witnesses, uh, even when they were being heavily threatened. The writer goes on to say, besides being the faithful witness, Jesus Christ was the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Uh, and of course, you know, they're thinking resurrection uh, and the, the encouragement that would give to be reminded that Jesus was the firstborn. Um, 
in our uh, like child order concepts, uh, most firstborns don't call themselves that unless there was a secondborn. You can say, I'm an only child, or I'm the firstborn. Uh, now, all only childs are the firstborn, but they don't usually use that label because there's no second. Uh, saying that Jesus is the firstborn implies that others will follow. And of course, we know from other passages that all of his people are going to be resurrected someday. Uh, and so, uh, him being the firstborn. Uh, there are other scholars who say, no, the, language, the grammar is ambiguous and the language is complicated. Uh, this is really saying... Uh, first is in the, the concept of primary, or the main, or the most important, uh, first in that sense. Uh, and so that also elevates uh, the importance of Jesus. Uh, you know, he's, he's numero uno, he's number one, he's the top, he's the head. Um, so he's the firstborn. Uh, and then he says that uh, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. <laughs> Believe it or not, scholars can't even agree on what that means. Uh, they actually look at uh, three different possible meanings of kings of the earth. Um, one of those meanings uh, is the, uh, the spiritual uh, warfare type things, those powers and authorities, um, spiritual uh, Satan and the demons and evil and, and all that, you know, those kinds of, uh, that have been ruling, uh, Jesus is now their king. There are others who say, no, he's talking about uh, earthly temporal kings. People like Herod the Great and Caesar uh, and, you know, President Biden. Uh, you know, those kinds of leaders. Uh, Jesus is now the ruler of those kings. He's, he's, a, he's in charge of them. And there are others who talk about the idea um, that uh, that <clears throat> um, uh, all the believers uh, are kind of uh, kings in a sense. Uh, we're told that someday we will rule, uh, help rule. Uh, and so he's talking about him being the ruler of all of his people. Uh, maybe that. But uh, regardless of which one of them it is, guess who's at the top? Jesus. Uh, he's that, that number one. Uh, and so having said that, uh, the writer here, uh, <clears throat> Revelations uh, 5, B, and 6, let me read that. Uh, basically, you know, let the glorifying begin. So he, he kind of breaks into uh, a prayer of, of glory or a doxology, uh, beginning with the second part of verse 5. To him who loves us and is freedom from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And so he's off with, uh, with glorifying Jesus. Uh, as he talks about Jesus and he recounts who Jesus is and what he's done, uh, he just can't help himself and, and breaks into this, this praise uh, shout on paper. <laughs> or on papyrus, as the case may have been. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, uh, that kind of praise and honor uh, continues to show up. But I want you to notice that, that even as he did that, when he starts off to him, he elaborated on Jesus again. Uh, we get more of this, uh, this uh, declaring who Jesus is and what he's done. This time, four things. Uh, <clears throat> He loves us. That's good to know. Um, you know, uh, for some reason, didn't happen today, but uh, most weeks, uh, beginning a couple of months ago, uh, at sharing time, Lily comes and reminds us that Jesus loves us. She wanted to. She wanted to. <laughs> um, <laughs> How much more simple can the message be? Jesus loves us. That is both simple and phenomenally profound. Uh, and so again, they're hearing that, that this Jesus, who is the, the ruler of all the kings of the earth, he loves us. 
this, this Jesus who is the faithful witness, we are being called upon to be faithful witnesses ourselves. And guess what? Jesus loves us. A little bit easier to stand up for Jesus knowing that he loves us. Uh, and so that's there. Uh, he freed us from sin. Uh, you know, Pat, Pat shared about that this morning uh, in, in our sharing time. Uh, freedom from sin. Uh, again, how much bigger can that be? Uh, <clears throat> and so he includes it here. That's, that's one of the reasons why uh, we don't simply focus on manger Jesus. That's cute, and we, we love to, uh, what that means to us. Uh, but he's also freed us from sins, Jesus. Uh, and we are reminded of that post-resurrection. Uh, he made us a kingdom. Uh, and again, you know, you go back to the Old Testament, you have this whole history of God calling Abraham, and his tribe's going to be big, and they're going to have, and someday they get a king, which God didn't even want for them, but they become a kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. Uh, <clears throat> and now, God is saying, that aside, all of my people, now form a kingdom. Uh, we are, I think we're all citizens of the United States, uh, but we are also citizens of this other kingdom. Uh, we are subjects of Jesus Christ, and he is our king, uh, and we are part of this kingdom. Uh, and then it says he made us priests. Um, you know, uh, the priests... Uh, this is probably referring to function. Uh, priests did a couple of main things. They were, uh, they were the ones who made the sacrifices. And uh, as a kingdom of priests, as, a, as, as being priests, um, we are all to sacrifice ourselves on the altar. Um, you know, as Paul put it, present yourselves a living sacrifice. Um, and then also priests were uh, intermediaries. Um, you talk about Job before the priesthood was established and everything, even, even at that time. Uh, once a week, Job would make a sacrifice uh, on behalf of his family. He was the patriarch. So because his kids may have sinned this week, you know, he's going to make sacrifices and try to do things. Uh, we are called to be intermediaries for God, not in the sense of uh, like we, we see like in the Roman church, uh, but in the sense of uh, we want to be go-betweens between God and sinners. We want to help connect them to Jesus. Uh, and, and we do that by, you know, bringing them to church, sharing the gospel, those kinds of things. Um, so we are priests. And so because of that, because Jesus loves us, freed us from sin, made us a kingdom, made us priests, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Um, <clears throat> more Jesus elaboration. And of course that ended with amen. And so just another uh, brief aside, uh, almost universally in the Christian church, when people pray, they end the prayer with the word amen. Uh, that, is, that is so standard. Uh, I'm sure there are places somewhere where somebody doesn't. But, uh, but apparently that happened started early. Uh, in this passage and in verse 7, um, <clears throat> Both of those prayer praise statements ended with the word amen. Uh, and so we kind of pick it up from the scripture. There are other places where it's used. Uh, and so we pick that up. Um, what they knew that we don't know as well because the, the word has kind of changed the way we use it uh, is we don't really know the definition so much. Uh, it was simply uh, amen is from the Greek form uh, that basically meant truly, or so be it. Uh, so when, uh, when someone prays something and you say amen, you're saying yes, I mean that. that let it be, or else it means this is the truth. Uh, and, and so Jesus often used the double amen uh, in the old King James. You would hear him saying, verily, verily, I say unto you. Uh, it was amen, amen, I say unto you. Uh, truly, truly, I say unto you. Uh, and so that's what amen comes from. That's why we use it. Uh, getting into verse 7. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. 
and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. So there's another amen. And so he talks here about the future, uh, and we get the idea of Jesus is coming back. Uh, and Paul said in Philippians that, you know, uh, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Uh, here he says, even those who pierced him. So Jesus is going to come back, and everyone's going to know and see him, and even the ones who pierced him. Imagine that. You're the guy that happened to be the Roman soldier on duty when they say, take this man up and crucify him. That guy's going to be there. That guy's going to see Jesus too. Um, <clears throat> what we don't know, whether or not that guy repented before he died, we don't know what his spirit process was, um, but Jesus is coming back, and that's for everyone. Um, and then in uh, verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. Um, and so again, uh, we're English speakers. Uh, you may, If you've heard it, you've probably heard it in church. Uh, but the Alpha and Omega represent the A and the Z of the Greek alphabet. Uh, the omega doesn't represent Z, but it, it represents the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And so uh, it's kind of that symbolic, I am the beginning and the end. I remember as a kid, sometimes uh, me and my sister would be getting into something, and something would develop, and the next thing you know, Dad's standing there, and, and either my sister or myself is saying, he or she started it. And my dad would say, Whoever started it, I'm finishing it. Well, Jesus started it. Uh, you know, Jesus was the creator. Uh, there, we get from John 1.1, 1, 1, you know, he was the creator of energy. And, of good, and on the cross, he said, it is finished. Uh, he did the work. He completed the work. Uh, and, uh, and now, someday, he's going to consummate the age. He is both the beginning and the end. Uh, and he will be the one who decides to finish. Uh, <clears throat> we began with the, the humble Jesus, manger Jesus, riding a donkey Jesus. Um, but we need to remember from those humble beginnings that we not just stay there, but that we also remember that he uh, has the power and the glory forever and ever, as expressed in Revelation 1.6. Uh, there's also that Jesus. And so that's why we also... Um, you know, our, our songs today focused on praising and honoring Jesus and glorifying him. And, and I read to you for our scripture passage, uh, the Jude doxology, where Jude does that. And we now sing that song. And so in a few minutes, I'm just going to make some announcements. And then we're going to sing the Jude doxology again. Uh, and this time, kind of remember those words from the scripture and how those come from that. Um, and it's part of our way of declaring that that he is worthy of the power and the glory forever and ever. Um, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. Uh, as we looked at some of these uh, things about Jesus, who he is and what he's done, um, just in that small passage, Lord, there's so much there. Um, such powerful things, such profound things. You love us. You freed us from sin. Um, all of that uh, about who you are. And uh, even though you were, you were born in a manger, uh, Lord, you have all power and authority. And you have it forever and ever. And so we take part in praising and honoring and glorifying you like that today. We ask you to be with us when we depart in a few minutes and go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. So I just want to make a, a few announcements. Um, and then uh, we're going to close again with, the, with that Jude doxology and declare those kinds of praises to God. Um, if you forgot your Easter offering last week, uh, we can receive it today. Uh, just put it in our offering box before you leave if you haven't already done so. I'm happy to report, uh, I'm blessed to report, uh, that I had set a challenge or a goal of raising $1,200. And as of last week, uh, the offering count came in at a little over $1,400. Uh, so we hit our, our target. Uh, for world evangelism. This Friday night, game night, uh, we'll meet at uh, 5.30. Oh, I think, I think, yeah. yeah, we'll meet at 
uh, and, uh, and start with uh, uh, pizza and snacks and, and have a good time. And uh, this time, uh, that's going to be provided for you. You don't need to, to bring a, a donation for that. Uh, but uh, do bring a friend. And uh, all adults and teens are invited. Uh, when we're done eating uh, our food, we'll get into the games. And there's a variety of that uh, to take place. And there's also some, uh, some in credit invitation reminders at the Welcome Center. If you want to pick up one to give to somebody, uh, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, a basket weaving class coming up for the ladies. Uh, it'll be something different and interesting. Uh, on May the 7th at 9 o'clock, there'll be a capital breakfast, and then you get training on basket making. Uh, the next Wednesday evening, uh, beginning at 6, a sub sandwich dinner, and then you'll finish it and, and make your basket. Um, this kind of, you know, it's kind of biblical, isn't it? Uh, way back, you know, when, when Moses' mother uh, put Moses in a basket and set him in the Nile River, someone made that basket. Uh, and so you guys can learn to do that. Uh, because of the, uh, the food and the materials, stuff that goes with that, uh, they are asking for a $35 fee, uh, which covers all of that. Um, we also uh, need to know ahead of time how many is participating. So please RSVP to Kim by uh, this Friday night. Uh, so if you don't do it before then, sooner is better than later. Uh, but at game night, be sure to tell her a little later than that. Uh, the complimentary photo booth we had last week, those photos, the five by sevens, have been printed, and they are available today. Many of you have already received yours. If you had your picture taken last week and haven't yet, see Kim. Uh, <clears throat> Pentecost Sunday, uh, we will celebrate the birth of the church uh, with a sandwich luncheon following worship on June the 5th. So be looking forward to that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our times are offering uh, boxes in the back offering in the box before you leave. And now uh, Rob is going to come. We're going to sing the Jude Doxology together. And, uh, and remember, try to tie it again to that uh, scripture passage I read earlier. Uh, and a reminder that, that you know, we're, we're praising this Jesus who did all these things the Revelator talked about. Let's all stand together.